This is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. A couple of things I wanted to get into before we get back to the phone, get into the NBA playoffs. The Celtics have tied this series. I thought that the first two games, they looked like the worst number one seed in history. But they've resurrected themselves. They've got themselves on track, courtesy, to some degree anyway, of the absence of Rajon Rondo, uh, who may end up being back before this series is over, according to Coach Fred Hoiberg. Not for Game 5, but possibly for Game 6 and 7. Still think this Celtics is going to win this series in seven games. Uh, but there is no doubt first two games, D-Wade and Rondo were teaching the Boston Celtics how to play playoff basketball. That's not the case now. Isaiah Thomas and those boys have got things going. And the lack of depth on the part of the boss or the Chicago Bulls are showing itself. And as a result, it is what it is. Um, the other playoff series in the Eastern Conference, the Cavaliers have clinched their seed. They're waiting for the winner of Toronto-Milwaukee. Milwaukee blew Toronto out in game three by about 30. And the next thing you know, they've been manhandled over the last two games. Uh, Toronto has turned it around. Milwaukee looks incredibly vulnerable. The Greek freak struggles at the free throw line and from the perimeter, even though he is the Greek freak, he is incredibly athletic, can handle the ball. He's got special talent. The future's bright. Um, But Milwaukee has appeared overmatched the last two games. I believe they will win game six. Probably won't win game seven in Toronto. Toronto may hold on, win this series, and end up going up against Cleveland. Boston, they'll win their series in seven, possibly. The Washington Wizards are a team that I wanted to get into because this Washington Wizards team is a team I believe is best suited to go up against the Cleveland Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference Finals. And I can't put into words how disgusted I am with what I saw from the Washington Wizards last night. John Wall showed up. Bradley Beal showed up. The rest of them, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Martin Gortat was a no-show. Markeith Morris getting himself in foul trouble, that's bad enough. Scoring just nine points, that's bad enough. But chirping about Paul Millsap being a crybaby, then getting thoroughly outplayed for two games, is an entirely different matter altogether. When you're Markeith Morris, you got to use more intelligence than that. you got to understand that because of who you are, here's the situation. Talking... You're bringing more attention to yourself when it comes to going up against a savvy veteran like Paul Millsap, who'll know how to use that to your to his advantage in a variety of different ways, including getting you in foul trouble, which happened last night. Markeith Morris can play. He's got a lot of heart. He's got no punk in him whatsoever. I like Markeith Morris. He's been embarrassed over the last two games. Plain and simple. And he needs to step it up. And Gortat needs to step it up. And Otto Porter, even though he didn't shoot bad, he needs to find a way to be more effective. And dudes like Kelly Uber and others need to come off the bench and be more effective. They can't leave everything to John Wall and Bradley Beal. And Bogdanovich, I like him. But I mean, the rest of these guys on Washington, I mean, they're walking around, sticking out their chest, acting like they've arrived. You haven't even been to a conference finals since 1979. That's damn near 40 years. We ain't even getting started. As to you playing in an NBA finals, not winning an NBA championship, I mean, suck it up. Handle your business. The Washington Wizards are a better team than the Atlanta Hawks, period. They're better. Even though I must admit, this kid, Tim Hardaway Jr., I mean, Tim Hardaway should be proud. I mean, Tim Hardaway Jr., ladies and gentlemen, he is on the come up. I like this kid. Once again, a former Nick shows up elsewhere and balls. After he's out of a Knicks uniform. Not while he's in one. Think about how David Lee looked for a little while after he left the Knicks. Jamal Crawford. Nate Robinson. Now we got Tim Hardaway Jr. I mean, it's like some black cat is running around the Knicks organization. Just contaminating everything it touches. I don't understand it, but that's what's going on. 
But I mean, this stuff has got to stop. Morris got to show up. Gortat's got to show up. Otto Porter and others got to show up. And by the way, as an aside, bringing levity to the situation, y'all think Shaquille O'Neal with his Shaq and the fool got on JaVel McGee, who, by the way, looks pretty decent right now in a Golden State Warriors uniform. But if y'all want to really, really laugh, I'm talking about Dave Chappelle kind of laughter. Charlie Murphy, the late Charlie Murphy. True Hollywood stories. Charlie Murphy. That kind of laughter. Watch Shaq and the Fool from a couple of years ago. If not last year. I think it was last year or the year before. With Otto Porter defending somebody on the right wing. And he's literally standing there while a dude runs all the way around (laughs) to the other side of the court. And Otto Porter completely forgot. (laughs) And the dude had left. The dude was standing in front of him next to you know it's going. And Otto Porter just stood there frozen, not even knowing the guy was going because he wasn't paying attention. Randy Whitman looked at him like, uh, oh, my Lord, it was so priceless. Hilarious. That's what you're dealing with here. They got to show up and they got to step up. Plain and simple. No excuses. No excuses. 866-729-ESPN. It's 866-729-3776. I promise I'll get into Pat Riley and write Thompson's piece in ESPN the magazine on Pat Riley. But I'll get to that in a few minutes. First, let me go to Chris in Los Angeles. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Chris? Randy Whitman looked at Turn down your radio, bro. Turn down your radio. All right. Go ahead. Hey, just real quick, Stephen A. So, obviously, we have uh, four series tied at two. Obviously, I don't need to go over the rundown. But which which teams do you, do you see likely lower seeds pulling off the upset? Um, out of those I four think, series? I think, I think out, of the, out of the series, I think Memphis has a better chance than most because LaMarcus Aldridge is a virtual no-show as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think that's a possibility. Um, well, Utah, you want to call it a lower seed, but they are five and the Clippers are four, but they had identical records. With Blake Griffin down, that's a possibility. Uh, but I still think Milwaukee has a shot to beat Toronto. Yeah, still, but not but not, not the way it looked last night, Stephen A. I know that. I know that. They got blown out the last two games. Okay, and last, real quick before I let you go. I, I, listen, I was listening to you talk about the uh, Wizards and the Hawks and the other guys stepping up. My, what I would say to you, Stephen A., to address that is these guys, like when the playoffs – come around, like, obviously teams get days off, they get time to really scout. So these players, you're not going to get really much from them because during the regular season is way different than the playoffs. So obviously teams are looking to not let these guys beat them. So I don't see Marquise and I don't see Otto and I don't see uh, um, I'm not talking about. I'm not asking Marquise to be John Wall or Bradley Beal. But you can't be – a no-show offensively after running your mouth and chirping about Paul Millsap. Step up. I agree. You want to talk, you want okay. to, talk to talk, back it up. I agree. Okay, I will see Stephen A. Thank you. Take it easy. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I wanted to transition <clears throat> to this article in ESPN the magazine about Pat Riley. Um, Pat Riley, the winner within, a champion as a player, as a coach, and as an executive. Um, It's had some rough times from a basketball standpoint over the last several years. LeBron James leaves nearly three years ago, about three years ago. Besides, he wants to take his talents back home. Cleveland grew up 30 minutes away in Akron as we all know Uh, Chris Bosh has some health issues and as a result uh, it it derails Miami's hopes because I can tell you last year if Chris Bosh hadn't gone down with the blood clot issue the Miami Heat would have faced LeBron and Cleveland in the conference finals I firmly believe that and then this past summer D. Wade decides to leave and go to Chicago. LeBron wanted to go home, but as the article points out, Pat Riley uh, flew out there to Vegas to see him and what have you. Maverick Carter, who was there four years ago, wasn't there this time around. It was Rich Paul in the room, along with Randy Mims and LeBron. And, you know, he talked, Pat Riley talked about how they were watching some soccer match. And, you know, 
going back and forth instead of focusing on him. And that's when he knew something was awry and even asked them to mute the TV so they could pay attention to what he was trying to say instead of uh, watching a soccer match. And a little while later, got a text message from Rich Paul telling him to expect a call. And LeBron got on the phone and basically said, I want to thank you for the four years. Pat Riley was hurt. Pat Riley took it personal. That ultimately had an effect on the relationship of Dwayne Wade, if you listen to some folks. Here's what I know. I know that to some degree all of that is true. But there's no negative side to all of this. And I need everybody to understand that. Pat Riley's old school, man. Man, 72 years old. He's old school. There's an old school way of doing things. And he's about winning. And anything, he's about winning, he's about loyalty. Right or wrong, Pat Riley's mentality, LeBron learned how to win when he arrived in South Beach. LeBron learned about family when he arrived in South Beach. Whether that's true or not, that's Pat Riley's belief. May admit it, may not. I'm telling you what I know. And Pat Riley's attitude is you with us, you against us. So when LeBron decides to leave, you are officially the enemy. I happen to know on good authority that Pat Riley was planning on retiring. If LeBron had elected to stay. Because he would have left the heat in good hands. His work will have been done. And that would have been that. But because. That was not the case. And LeBron decided to leave. Pat Riley said, I ain't going to any damn place. Signed five-year extension, eventually. The D-Wade thing is what's most devastating. Drafted D-Wade. Was family with D-Wade. Was at D-Wade's wedding to the lovely Gabrielle Union. I know I was there. Pat Riley loved D-Wade. But Pat Riley, the executive, had to think about winning. And saw that D. Wade's skills through age and attrition were fading to some degree. And foolishly decided to play hardball. I'm going to give him $41 million. He'll take it. He ain't going nowhere. This is Miami. Never mind that Chicago's got $47 million on the table. Never mind that Milwaukee has about the same on the table. Never mind that Denver had $53 million on the table. D. Wade's not going to leave me. He assumed he was wrong. And he was wrong because in the process, there was an article written by Dan Lebertard, who at least D. Wade's camp believes was ultimately Pat Riley talking through Dan Lebertard. Took it personally. Felt like he was being blamed for some things or not being given enough credit for some things or that he should have been more appreciative for some things. D. Wade was out the door. Pat Riley was devastated. D. Wade's attitude was This $4 million that Hassan Whiteside was going to shove aside for Kevin Durant. Well, since Kevin Durant ain't coming, why not shove that aside for me? D-Wade and people like LeBron James are also proud black men. They don't consider themselves just basketball players. They consider themselves businessmen, too. And they have a personal affront to this notion when executives come to them and talk about taking care of them later on down the road when their playing career is over. So in other words, you want me to need you then too. That's how they take stuff like that. That may not have been how Pat Riley meant it. That's how they absorbed it. And last but not least, you had a situation where Pat Riley in the Miami, regardless of what Pat Riley tells you, believes that D. Wade knew all along that LeBron was leaving for Cleveland. And D-Wade never told him a thing. Now, D-Wade will tell you otherwise. LeBron will tell you otherwise. Everybody will tell you they didn't know what LeBron's decision was until he made it, even though I had heard a year in advance that LeBron was going back to Cleveland. I just refused to believe it because, damn it, it's South Beach or Cleveland. What do you expect me to think? I'm not thinking somebody will leave South Beach. So I didn't report it. And I'm the one who broke the story in 2010 that he was going to South Beach. But all of those things happen. And Pat Riley 
basically questioned D. Wade's loyalty. Challenged it to some degree. Because are you with him or are you with us? In hindsight, did Pat Riley take things a bit too personally? Probably. Did Pat Riley mishandle D. Wade? Absolutely. But Pat Riley is not some incompetent, insensitive boob that happens to be an executive for the Miami Heat. He's a winner. Who's loyal to his guys? In his mind, he was being loyal to D-Wade. And he thought D-Wade would be loyal to him. In hindsight, he recognizes that he could have done more to make D-Wade feel like the family member he is. To this day, I am sick seeing D-Wade in a Chicago Bulls uniform. He belongs in a Miami Heat uniform. If he were in a Miami Heat uniform, it wouldn't be the Chicago Bulls in the playoffs in the first round. It would have been a Miami Heat. But D-Wade who wasn't just a star player and a future Hall of Famer and a three-time champion, but he was also an ultimate recruiter for the Miami Heat, did deserve better. Pat Riley did not mistreat D. Wade, however, because of lack of love, because of a focus on business or whatever. If Pat Riley is guilty of anything, it's of taking D. Wade a little bit for granted in the end. That's about all. Pat Riley's a winner. Pat Riley's a leader. And I owe him a personal debt of gratitude for how he's treated me in the past. And a level of confidence that he instilled in me. Believing in myself and helping to motivate me when he did not have to do that. Pat Riley is flawed at times because he's old school and usually old school folks have difficulty transitioning to a younger generation. When he sees a Rich Paul representing a LeBron James, he's not looking at Rich Paul as the adult that Rich Paul is and the businessman as an agent that he has proven himself to be. He's looking at him as one of LeBron's boys, basically a kid trying to negotiate with him. It's wrong, but it's predictable for old school guys. At that age, to view youngsters in that fashion. It happens in all walks of life. Doesn't make you a bad guy. Doesn't make you a criminal. Doesn't make you evil or malicious in any way. It just makes you somebody that had a hard time adapting to new times due to your old school tendencies. That's all. Pat Riley made a mistake with D-Wade. At times he took LeBron James for granted because of waiting until the last minute to tell him that D-Wade wouldn't be able to play on particular nights and LeBron had to carry the load and wasn't appreciating LeBron enough. You could have been a bit, a, bit, a little bit more lenient with LeBron and his friends and his mama in terms of them having their ways at America Airlines Arena in Miami and stuff like that. A little bit too micromanaging on the part of Pat Riley. But Pat Riley's a good man. He's one hell of an executive. He's a champion on every level. He's a winner. And it's my hope personally that before D-Wade says goodbye to the NBA as one of its greatest players ever, that he'll find himself back in a Miami Heat uniform where he belongs. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Once upon a time, New Yorkers were happy that Phil Jackson was here. Los Angeles should be very, very happy that Magic Johnson is here. But based on resume and based on accomplishments, what organization on this planet would not want Pat Riley? If we're being honest, we have to admit, 
not too many. There may be some bodies that's greater, but that doesn't mean he ain't great. Pat Riley special. We have to remember that. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's go to Jacob in Staten Island. You're live with Stephen A. Jacob, good afternoon. Hey, Stephen A. I love the show. Thank you. Um, I want to know, what do you think of the chances of the Clippers beating the Warriors if the Clippers beat the Jazz? Zero. Zero. What about before when they had Blake Griffin still? Zero. Still zero. Wow. Still zero. I think if they had Blake Griffin, they could have... They could, there's a small chance they could have beat him. I don't believe it. The Clippers are too lethal from the perimeter. And I'm sorry, the Warriors are too lethal from the perimeter, and the Clippers are too haphazard. One of the things that I have a problem with in terms of Doc is very little that I have problems with as, as it pertains to Doc Rivers, the coach. Doc Rivers, the executive, leaves room for improvement, but Doc Rivers, the coach, there's very little that I find it, it floored with him. But this is one of them. I hate how he gives Blake Griffin the ball to dribble. Blake dribble. Blake Griffin will dribble up the court on fast breaks. Blake dribble will dribble and try to put the ball between his leg and put his head down and drive into the lane and all of this. Stuff. I don't want to see that from Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin is athletic. Blake Griffin isn't the Skywalker that he used to be, but he can still get up. He's a legit six nine, six ten. He's got power moves. I just wish that he wouldn't be dribbling the ball so much. I think that's counterproductive, and that's not the kind of thing that's going to beat the Warriors. All right, but do you think the Clippers are going to beat the Jazz? Um, I think it'll go seven games and Chris Paul can pull through. I think Chris Paul with DeAndre Jordan and the rest of the crew, particularly with Austin Rivers coming back, able to spell for a couple of guys. I think that's going to be helpful to them. But in the end, uh, listen, Utah can beat them, especially with Gordon Haywood. I mean, if he doesn't have any food poisoning and he's out on the court with Joe Johnson, they could do some things. And Rudy Gobert being back, Utah certainly could beat them. I'm just a believer in Chris Paul. I really, really believe in him. And I think that he can find a way to lead. Other guys have got to step up, though. But I think that even if the Clippers do win the series, there's no way in hell they're beating Golden State. You can scratch that dream. All right. Thanks for taking my call, Stephen. Thank you. Take it easy. Let's go to Dominic in D.C. You're live with Stephen A. Dominic, what's up? So, Stephen A., how's it going? I'm all right. You're live on the air. Go ahead, buddy. Make your point. Yeah, man. I, I want to ask you, do you think that it's bad for business for uh, Doc Rivers to have his son playing for him? I mean, not necessarily, you know, too much favoritism, but just conflict of interest. You know what I mean? Maybe when it's time to come, he might anything. not I want to. I don't want to hear anything about conflict of interest. Uh, people throughout NBA history uh, have had conflicts of interest, nepotism, and all of that other stuff. Nobody said anything else uh, when they did it. I don't want to hear anything about Doc Rivers doing it. Okay. And do you think, uh, when do you think the Saints should focus on defense? Their defense hasn't been pretty good. They should have been focusing on defense for the last two to three years. I like the fact that they got Adrian Peterson, but they need more help on their defense. They ranked third last against the pass and 31st overall defensively. I definitely think they should have been operating on, uh, focusing on defense. De- them picking up Adrian Peterson, who had worse numbers than Mark Ingram, to me makes no sense. And I believe in Adrian Peterson. I think that he'll make, uh, he'll resurrect himself just like he did a few years ago when he got injured. But in the end, that's not where their biggest problem lies. The biggest problem with the New Orleans Saints is their defense. It's not their offense. Maybe their strategy is run the football more with Drew Brees and he's keep the defense off the field, that's going to help. But in the end, you're not going to stop yourself from putting up points in buckets. And if you can do it that way, then guess what? You ain't going to be worried about not doing it. You're going to continue to score, and your defense is going to be on the field anyway. So it makes no sense whatsoever. I got to run, though. I appreciate the call. Thank you. Devin in Virginia, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Devin. Hey, what's going on, Stephen A? Uh, thanks for taking the call. Go ahead, man. No problem. Hey, hey yeah, man. You're talking about Deshaun Watson. It's just wild for me how... Uh, um, when they do the draft boards and all that stuff, they don't factor in winners. You know, um, Young, Vince Young came out. He came out number two, all the doubts and all that stuff. That dude won. He came out number three. Vince Young, Vince Young was number three. Go ahead. Yeah, but, I mean, he was a winner. Tebow, if Peyton Manning didn't come, he would still have his job, and he was a winner. And no one wanted to give him a shot because he's not prototypical or what they want, you know, what they want to see. But he, all these dudes just come out failing. So now I'm there with Tim Couch, of the world. All, all, all these prototypical quarterbacks that are supposed to be have this big arm and have this accuracy, they can't win. They don't have to, you know, they don't have that heart. So, you know, I agree with you. I think Deshaun Watson should definitely take number one. Within well, the I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm not saying that Deshaun Watson should be number one overall. I'm saying he should be the first quarterback taken. 
based on the competition that he has at the quarterback spot. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying he should be taken number one overall, but I definitely believe that he should be taken as the first quarterback, in my opinion. I'm not going with some dude that coached that through 13 games for North Carolina. That's not good enough for me. I need more of a resume than that. Appreciate it, though. Thank you so much. Hermie Bay, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Hey, What's up, man? Long time listener, first time caller. Just really quick, uh, do you think that the uh, Wizards are going to uh, beat the, the Hawks? And if they don't, is John Wall going to probably just try to look for another team? And what do you think would be best fit? Well, first of all, I don't think that John Wall is going to look for another team. Um, but I do, And I do think that the Washington Wizards will beat and should beat the Atlanta Hawks. I think they're the better team. They're just not playing like it right now, which I'm sad to say. I don't understand it. I don't like it one bit. They got to get their act together, but we'll see what happens. But in the end, what it comes down to is this. John Wall, when you look at the Wizards right now, you got to remember this about John Wall, okay? He still has two years left on his contract. He still has got two years left on his contract. They need to renegotiate. They need to sit up there and up his salary, particularly after giving Bradley Beal $128 million. Uh, but but if you're talking about John Wall, he's going to get $16.7 million next year and 17.8 the year after. I think he's got to play an option one of those years, but I'm not sure. In the end, he's not going anywhere for the immediate future, and I think they, they could beat Atlanta. Uh, my problem is is the help that he's got. He's getting. Otto Porter needs to step up. Markeith Morris, he's getting paid $7.4 million this year, $8 million next year, $8.6 million the year after. Gortat's at $12 million. They're getting paid to do a job, too. They need to step up and do it. They really, yeah, really they do. Pay. They've been paying big money. And, and if you look throughout the league, who, who really can help the Wizards get to that final level? Me like personally, it, it, I think it would have been best if Al Horford had gone there. That would have been a very, very big deal. I would love to see Paul George with the Wizards personally, but you may not need another dude like that because he would demand the ball more, and that would take shots away from Beal and uh, Wall. So you might not need that that much. But I do need they think, I do think they need a bigger guy who can score the ball. Ideally for me, I don't think it could happen i would love to see carmelo anthony in the wizards uniform playing with wall and uh and bradley bill i would love that that would be me appreciate the call 866-729-ESPN it's 866 729 your phone calls to close out the show in a minute with Stephen a on espn radio guess what you're in the middle of the Stephen a smith show podcast damn it i mean it somebody i encourage all of y'all to listen to is a guy by the name of warren ballantyne he's a friend of mine uh, does uh, political talk radio. Um, you can catch him on Sirius XM channel 142 uh, every weekday. Talented brother. Wish him nothing but the best, but I want everyone to know that he's banned from talking to me about sports. Texting me during the show, trying to tell me that the Chicago Bulls are going to make some noise, like they're going to beat Cleveland because they won four games during the regular season. That just shows me that he's in his realm. News, politics, stuff like that. He has no business talking about sports. Has no objectivity whatsoever. He's entirely too emotional. Uh, this is something that's not foreign to all of us. Uh, we have friends and loved ones that we communicate with every day that has no credibility whatsoever in certain realms because they're too emotional and not logical and, and, and practical. The Bulls are going to give LeBron James and the Cavs a run for their money in the playoffs once they get past Boston. See, I don't have time. I'm not entertaining stuff like that. But listen to his show. On channel 142 Sirius XM. Because the brother's talented. Just don't ask him anything about sports. He don't know what he's talking about. Not if he thinks the Bulls are going to beat Cleveland. Just just why? Talk about they're going to go seven games. See, I can't listen to stuff like that. He's not allowed to talk about sports with me anymore. He's not allowed. Let's go back to the phones. Let's go to Chris in New Jersey. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Chris? Stephen A., two quick points, and I'll be quick. I, I promise. Number one, I have one on, the, one on the NBA playoffs, two on the New York Giants. I don't know if you remember me, but I called about a month ago. And I made a comment that you saw as blasphemy. I compared Rajon Rondo. I said he has a little bit of Russell Westbrook in him. And what I Rajon meant Rondo. by that. Rajon Rondo. Go ahead. I, I did not mean he has, he's as gifted, as physically talented as Westbrook. Because I'm, uh, I'm a former professional basketball, semi-pro. I know the game. If anybody thinks that Rondo is as good as Westbrook physically, then you're out of your mind. What I meant was he's got a little bit of that dog in him. He's got that winning mentality in him. And all I'm saying is, do you see what I meant now in these first two games? How valuable he's been to Chicago? No, I don't see what you, I don't. I don't see what you meant. I don't see what you saying. He's valuable is entirely different than saying he's comparable to Westbrook. I don't see the comparison. 
I what I mean is UCL Westbrook has that will to win. He'll take your heart out, right? Do you see a little bit of that, no. Rondo? How no. could you not? No. How could you not? No. I'm just telling you how. What you say? You why? Because why? Because he's a, why? Because in two games he was having a good series against the Celtics. Really? Have a nice day, man. Go play your semi basketball. Call me back when. Wait. Don't waste your time being on hold with such ridiculous points. No, I don't see it. I don't see a comparison between Rajon Rondo and Russell Westbrook. But Rondo's a champion. He's a winner, and I get that. But I don't see the comparisons to Russell Westbrook. No, I still don't see it. Sorry. Man in Florida, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, what's up, man? Big fan. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I got two things. Um, how long do you think Kevin Durant will be with the Warriors? And if he, I don't know how long he, he I don't know how long he'll be, but he's staying after this year. Yeah. I've been told he's already he's agreed. He's staying after this year. this year. He's staying after this year. Yes, I said it three times oh, now. Good. Go ahead. Oh, good. Um, um, you don't have long... another question. I got to get to another call. Thank you for calling. See, y'all got to call up on this show and be ready. I got hundreds, if not thousands, of people at a time calling up to the show. You call up here, get your points. By the way, I appreciate the love. I thank you so much for the love and affection y'all have for me. I can't have this show without y'all, and I appreciate that. But I don't need all the pleasantries. I don't even need you to tell me how much you love my show. I really don't. I need you to be online, get to your point. quicker you get to your point, the more time you're going to have to say what you need to say, and I can move on after giving you your opportunity to speak. Get to the point. Sean in Long Island, you're live. What's up? Yeah, Stephen A., there's a lot of exciting fights going on in boxing right now. With you and Max Kellerman being on the same show, you would think it would get more coverage. Why doesn't it? Because it's what it's not what resonates in the news. When when Canelo Alvarez is about to fight Julio Cesar Chavez, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Floyd and McGregor. We're going to talk about uh, 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 Triple G and when he fought. What Lemieux and when he knocked that kid out. We're going to talk about those things. But you're not going to talk about every single match. And by the way, in the United States of America, who the hell does? I mean, forget the shows. Who's talking about boxing to that degree? If it ain't an elite marquee fight, who's talking about it? Daniel Jacobs, when he fought Triple G, we talked about that. But you don't see. But the marquee dudes, you just don't see that. Were we supposed to talk about Charlo knocking out Hartley? Really? Hartley deserves that kind of shine? No, he does not. Charlo might, eventually. We talked about Keith Thurman. We're going to talk about Errol Spence versus Cal Brook. We're going to keep our eyes on Crawford and what he's doing next. But like anything else in life, hell, if you ain't marquee, folks in television ain't going to talk about it. It's a very simple answer. Good point. So speaking of uh, Kel Brook and Errol Spence, what do you think about that fight? I'm an Errol Spence fan. Kel Brook is no joke. Triple G is big time, but he fought the smaller guy. That's no indication of Kel Brook. If anything, it's an indication in a positive direction because even though Kel Brook wouldn't quit, he wanted to quit when he got his eye socket popped. The fact of the matter is he's very, very tough. Kel Brook can fight, and he's tough. It's not going to be easy for Errol Spence Jr. He is not Triple G. The flip side is Errol Spence Jr. is a bad, bad brother, and by that I mean good. I like him. I'm a fan of his, and and I hope he beats Kell Brook, even though it's not going to be easy. But I'm a Spence fan, and I want him to win. Appreciate the call. Chris and Callie, you're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Chris, go. Yo, yo Stephen A., thank you. Uh, tell me on why the Lakers should blow up for Paul George, please. I don't think they should blow up. I don't think it requires them blowing up. You can send you can send away a couple of players to get Paul George. He's 26 years old. He's a star. He averages 26 a game, 46% shooting, nearly 40% from three-point range. He's been in conference finals before. Is he LeBron? No. Is he even James Harden? No. But the brother is big time. He can play, and you're the Lakers you desperately need some kind of commodity to attract potential free agents to want to come to Los Angeles. That is not who they are. That is not who they've been. And as far as I'm concerned, they need to get a star in the purple and gold again. I have no problem with Paul George being in a Lakers uniform. I got to get on out of here, but I will holler at y'all 22 hours from now. Until then, peace and love, everybody. Talk to you soon. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app.